You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, presented by Trainer Road, cycling's most effective training tool. Yeah, it's been a huge year for me, you know, winning E3 and such a great tour, getting married, honeymoon, book coming out and everything. But um, yeah, I think the highlight has to be winning a podcast Pedal de Cham award, for sure, that t-shirt. It's a private place in my wardrobe. This is only the beginning. You can't even imagine what we are going to do for the future. With exclusive interviews and the best analysis on two wheels, this is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And Daniel Freib. Hello. Crazy gang back together. First time in 2016. How are you, chaps? Very well, thank you, yeah. Yeah, rested, recovered, ready to go. Well, you've been cycling, haven't you, Lionel? You've been cycling, Richard. It's is like, that obvious? It is, yeah, looking Ripped. looking good. Well, I mean, we've been following our Trainer Roads programme. We'll talk maybe a bit more about that. But I was out in Mallorca a couple of weeks ago. That was our first podcast of 2016 from the training camps. It was very noticeable because we did a ride last year at the Team Sky training camp. They organised a media race and I was an embarrassment to myself. And all of us actually let us down last year at the Team Sky media race this year. I think I give a very good account of myself, even if I say so myself. 2016, the Chinese year of the peacock, of the second <laughs> <Belgian peacock. laughs> No, I listen, I, I, I was, it was a very noticeable difference, a great sort of advert for the Trainer Road programme. As Coach Chad keeps telling us, it's just a case of sticking with it, just mm. doing it consistently. Mm. And, you know, you don't see a sudden improvement, it's just gradual mm. realisation that you're a little bit fitter. I can feel Daniel zoning out already. I mean, you know, he feels left out of this whole trainer road thing. But I, no, yeah, my experience athlete, is exactly the same. Not. I was in France cycling for a few days and felt better than I've felt for a long, long time. And I really struggled with the last block of trainer road. I was quitting sessions two thirds of the way through, didn't feel like I was performing very well but the proof of the pudding is in the eating you need a vision of of lance armstrong like in the kieran hodgson show that we saw last year where lance armstrong appears at your shoulder and does a version of his dodgeball cameo <laughs> about quitting anyway where are we lionel uh we're in a studio at the headquarters of audio boom near tower bridge in london today daniel how are you daniel you, right. we missed you at the end of last year you were on sabbatical in berlin back yeah, refreshed. Yeah, you know, you know me. We do. Um, and a few weeks ago, you were in, back in Berlin at the Giant Alpsen team correct, launch. That's correct. How was that? It was very good. It was in the Italian embassy, slightly odd venue. Um, there was a tenuous link with Tom Dumoulin's Giro ambitions. He announced there that he's going to ride the Giro d'Italia. He's going to be targeting that this year. Um, otherwise, yeah, there were Ferrero Rocher passed around um R- really no no actually the weren't but it really felt like that kind of occasion it felt like that kind of the ambassador's context. reception yeah it really was um <laughs> very lack security as well i noticed which uh, how else would you get in oh well, well exactly um you know about 100 journalists piled into this embassy i think there'd been terrorist threats in berlin the day before um i was expecting to be patted down um strip search but Expecting or hoping. None of that, can, or can or hoping. <laughs> none of that took place, so in, in we went, and it was um, a very cordial time was had by all. Well, we'll be hearing from, uh, some interviews from that team launch a bit later on, but, of course, Giant Alperson been in the news for more unfortunate reasons. We'll, we'll talk about the racing season has kicked off, we should point out. And, in fact, you're going to give us a round-up, but we're going to talk about the awful crash involving Giant Alperson in a moment because I happen to be in the same hotel as them at the weekend in Spain. But first of all, we are going to talk about the racing in the next part. So, Lionel, give, will, you, will you give us a sort of round-up, please? 2016 road season kicked off um, with the Tour Down Under, the first World Tour race of the year in Adelaide, as it always is. After last season, which was ruined by crashes and broken bones, Simon Gerrans won the Tour Down Under for the fourth time in his career. He won back-to-back stages to set himself up and then defended his lead on the Adelaide Alpe d'Huez, Willunga Hill, where Richie Port got his first victory in BMC colours after his move from Sky, which almost certainly means he's going to win the Tour de France. 
just put it out there now. Might as well. Um, Caleb Ewan, the 21-year-old Orica Green Edge sprinter, took the Curtain Raising Tour Down Under Classic and two stages of the Tour Down Under itself, and he attracted attention on social media, particularly with his Cav-esque low-profile sprinting style with his nose almost on the handlebars. Quite remarkable. Licking the road. Richard, you, saw, you pointed out the pictures of those of that on Twitter. Meanwhile, over in Argentina, Nairo Quintana finished third in the Tour de San Luis, won by his younger brother and Movistar teammate Daya Quintana. Another of the young sprinters tipped to challenge the likes of Cavendish Kittle & Co. Fernando Gaviria of Etix Quickstep won a stage but then crushed out, sustaining a fractured arm. Adriano Malori, the Movistar Italian time trialist, he suffered a serious crash in Argentina as well and was put into a medically induced coma in hospital. The latest reports, though, are that he is recovering well. And in fact, crashes really have dominated the first week or so of the season because in Calpe, in southern Spain, a car collided with a group of giant Alpecin riders while they were out training. John Degenkolb and Warren Barguil were among those involved. And as you say, Richard, you were out there in Spain. We know that a 73-year-old British woman has been charged with, we believe, or has has been reported driving on the wrong side of the road Mm. and collided with the group of giant Alpecin riders. Richard, you were out there in Spain what more can you tell us? Well, yeah, I was in Carpe and I was there to interview John Degenkolb and Tom de Mula, among other people. Obviously, those interviews didn't happen. De Mula wasn't involved in the crash, but the whole team were were in shock, really, and, and very upset and, and certainly not in the mood to, to do interviews. Um, I just arrived, really, on Saturday when, you know, word filtered around the hotel that this awful crash had happened. There were six giant Alps and riders um, riding together in a group, uh, Warren Barguil was there, Chad Haga, the American rider who who was worst off, John Degenkolb. So it was quite a quite a group of of riders. I got a lift the following morning with Ramon Sinkledem, the 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 ride, big sort of classics rider who was um, also in, in the group, and his face was a, a mess, covered in bandages. He actually had a broken clavicle that he didn't realise at the time, and and that was only discovered when he returned home. So yeah, there was a. It, it it was terrible, and it was one of those moments where you know I sort of uh, felt very uncomfortable being there as a journalist because, frankly, um, you felt like you were intruding on on private grief a little bit. The the giant ops and riders there was a big group of them there, twelve to fifteen riders sat together in the evening and and chatted. And I mean, it's worth pointing out that at that point, I don't think the full extent of the injuries were known there was still a lot of concern about Haga in particular and whether he'd sustained any 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 brain injury uh, that that is not the case thankfully and he's been very amusing the last couple of days on Twitter announcing his uh, you know his he's on the road to recovery I think so that's great news Degenkolb almost lost a finger um, and is pretty bashed up he remains in a, in a hospital in Valencia as we speak, and there's rumours that he could be out for three months, which is a long time. Warren Barguil as well will be out for, for quite a while. He broke uh, broke his arm, broke his wrist. So a really nasty crash, and I think, yeah, I mean, there were a lot of cyclists, a lot of teams staying in Calpe. You know, it's a, it's a very popular winter training base. I, I saw quite a few teams, like Astana were out, and Post were there, which is why Sean Kelly was there as well, who who I chatted to a wee bit. There were a lot of rumours about what exactly had happened, rumours that they'd just been doing a sprint effort, and and that's when the collision occurred. I spoke to one of the giant ops and mechanics who said that wasn't the case; that they were just riding along, um, you know, minding their own business, and and this car came careering towards them on on the wrong side of the road. Sean Kelly said that they the the team had had asked them that morning and posted to, to borrow a couple of vehicles and and some parking cones for exercises and we wondered whether that that had been a factor in what happened but I don't think so. It was it was interesting that Giant Alpson had no team cars there. They had a mechanics truck and a rented van but no team cars and as I say it was a big group of riders 12 15 riders. Um you know, who, when training on the roads, looked quite vulnerable. And they are quite busy roads around there, around the coast especially. Inland, it's much quieter. I was chatting to, to the young Belgian rider Nathan Van Hoydonk, who rides for BMC's development team, and he was saying that the roads around there are quite busy, and from now onwards they become busier as more and more tourists arrive. And there are a lot of British people there as well, you know, who 
or in rental cars and so on. And I just wondered about whether it was the safest place. There are certainly quieter parts. Well, it's interesting, CalPay has become more and more popular every single year, and it, it seems to be almost de rigueur now as the place to go. Um, it's just, for those who don't know where CalPay is, is it the Costa? Costa Brava. Brava, mm. just above Benidorm, isn't it? Mm. Um, even as, as recently as 10 years ago, Tuscany was really the place where most teams would go on winter training camps. Um, not only the Italian teams, the sort of the strip of coastline between Livorno and Grosseto, or just above Rome, um, th- th- there would be a huge sort of enclave of, of teams there, um, or a huge contingent of, of teams there every January. Um, but yeah, Calpe is is the destination of choice these days. And that's interesting what you say, Rich, In if the traffic is is bad, it's almost quite surprising that teams are flocking there. It, in quite it is. Numbers. I mean, it it's, depends who you speak to. I mean, speaking to Van Hoydonk, he was saying, I, I don't know why we all come here because the roads are quite busy. When I spoke to Kelly about that, he said, no, no, the roads are very quiet. Uh, it's not. He said it's not as busy as Majorca. Van Hoydonk says, I don't know why we don't go to Majorca. It's much quieter. I was in Majorca the previous week the roads there are very, very quiet at this time of year. Um, and I think, uh, you know, if you, as I say, if you go inland from Calpe, it does become much quieter. But there are certainly quieter places in, in Spain, I think, if you go further inland, around Sierra Nevada, mountains and places like that. Um, I think Majorca is quieter. But, you know, I mean, this, this accident could happen at any time, anywhere. It's a, It seems to have been the fault of, of the driver. Um the riders are, as we're always reminded, sharing public roads with with uh, with cars. And I I drove from Alicante Airport to Calpe, and you know the last bit towards the coast, you know, quite mountainous, quite twisting roads. I saw quite a few riders out training. I saw a few Astana riders, and they are they they tend to train without a vehicle with them. And it's it's a difficult one because if a team is out with a vehicle, they're also causing quite a an obstruction to other to other road users. And this is something I've spoken to Rod Ellingworth, the Sky Race Coach, formerly the um, director of the British Cycling Academy. Um, I've spoken to him about it before, and he, yeah, he had various experiences back when he was coaching the academy. Where, particularly in Australia, there was a period in Australia where there were a lot of bad road accidents, and one very notorious one, um, which unfortunately I think claimed the life of uh, Amy Gillett. Um, who was an Australian Institute of Sport rider. I think it was a fairly big group, or certainly a group of riders got taken out on that occasion. But Rod, um, around that time, he spent quite um, a few periods in Australia with the academy, and he would generally leave them in their groups to go out riding on their own, and he would stay back at the accommodation, the hotel or the flat. And there were a couple of occasions when he got calls um, from riders um, who had crashed and he had to subsequently go to hospital, but he said he lived in in terror of receiving a call about precisely that, about the whole group having been taken out. Mm. And it is something, unfortunately, that's uh, an occupational hazard. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, isn't it? I I was there uh, in the hotel and I was, you know, the press officer from the team came and told me what had happened confidentially, you know, and, you know, obviously I respected that. And at that point, we really didn't know how bad it was. And, and you know, he, he told me the riders involved and that one had been airlifted to hospital, it was Chad Haga, that there was a, that he lost, and the mechanic told me too that there was real a real scare because he lost a lot of blood. He had deep wounds in his neck in particular. And... You know, I, I I was there and I, I ceased to be a journalist because I, I didn't, you know, I, as I say, I didn't want to jump the gun. I didn't want to be putting anything out on social media where even the families of the writers hadn't been told. And, and because we didn't know yet what the real, the you know, what actually happened and what the what the extent of the, the injuries were. And it was, I was watching on Twitter as as news filtered out and then some of the speculation, some of the rumours, and, and some of it was pretty far-fetched and wild. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think it was important to just not contribute to that and to just step back and allow the team to release the information as and when that information was actually I confirmed. The same applies with Adriano Malori's crash in the Tour de San Luis, which Lionel mentioned in his roundup. There have been rumours over the last couple of days that he actually had an aneurysm um, prior to the crash and that is what actually caused the crash I mean it was a the circumstances were fairly unusual Mallory was uh, on the front of the bunch just seemed to be riding normally and then all of a sudden 
came crashing down. Um, it certainly looked slightly curious, but again, as you say, it's purely speculation at this point, um, and we have to wait to find out what actually happened. Well, we've really kicked off on quite a somber have, note, yeah, haven't we? Yeah, but I mean, you know, this is, this, as Daniel said, it unfortunate, but it is an occupational hazard, and every time a uh, professional or, um, you know, elite cyclists want to prepare for their season, you know, they're doing tens of thousands of kilometres a year in training on public roads, um, and they have to, you know, they have to mix it with with the traffic. And as we know, you know, nowhere is immune to the the problems of, of dangerous or bad driving, or or just uh, you know a terrible error of judgment. We don't know the circumstances in Calpe, but um, you know, we've we've all ridden bikes enough to have those near misses, and and you know, you do sort of touch wood and and hope that um, you know every time you get out on the road, it, it's going to be okay. And these guys. You know, riding in groups, you know, in a way, you know, they they are taking up more of the road, and and like you say, the the possibility of a of a car hitting, you know, a group, is increased in in these areas where there there are training camps. But the the problem is a difficult one to solve. And I remember a few years ago, Sky tried to kind of reinvent the wheel a little bit in terms of venues for training camps, didn't they? They had their first training camp in a much Valencia. more, yeah, much yeah. more unusual part of Spain, and 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 really anecdotally, that you know that turned out to be a bit of a disaster. That was based on ten years of weather data that showed it was the driest place in Europe, and they arrived and it, it was. It rained. It rained constantly. <laughs> Unfortunately, they booked it in the middle of monsoon season. Didn't they? <laughs> but again, that was because they thought the area would be quieter as well. I mm. think at that time of year, and you know, maybe well, maybe it saw, was or wasn't. I but. mean, um, not to be too flippant, but I think we might have mentioned this in the podcast before. But um, talk about quiet roads. I mean, last year the same team, Giant Alpacin, or some of their riders were taken out on a Californian cycle path by Peter Sagan's girlfriend. Become a friend of the podcast for 2016. For £10, you'll have access to our friend specials, 11 in-depth episodes that will take you even further inside the sport. All our friend specials are now available on your mobile device. Our 2015 friend specials are also still available for £5. To sign up, visit www thecyclingpodcast.com Daniel, well, we've mentioned a couple of things you were at Giant Opson and you've told us about the strange atmosphere at the Italian Embassy in Berlin who did you speak to and you know what was the general vibe around the team Grab some time with uh, Lawrence Tendam new signing um, one of uh, not that many experienced riders in that team um, he's come from Lotto Jumbo uh, at one point as we'll hear in the interview it, it looked and sounded as though Tendam was contemplating quite a radical change of direction. Um, he was going to go and ride full time for a, a US domestic team. It was something that he wanted to do for more as a lifestyle choice, really, than um, due to any particular goals that he had over there. But um, he, he's ended up at Giant Alpacin, and he'll be very valuable, I think, for Warren Balgil, who will hopefully recover fairly promptly from the injuries he sustained at the weekend and be competitive later in the year at the Tour de France. But, um, yeah, Tendam, always a fairly quirky, um, engaging character. Um, and he told me about his move to Santa Cruz. He's spending a lot of time in Santa Cruz. His love of barbecues. His love of barbecues, which I think we've documented or we've spoken about before. Documented Uh, his love of barbecues. On the podcast. Well documented on the podcast. Should we just go in and hear Yeah, let's hear Lawrence Tendam. So you're not going to be part-time professional cyclist, part-time nomad, no? No, uh, no. You're still a a full-time professional cyclist. I've got several places to stay next year in the US, and actually... From August, we don't know yet. Okay. After the tour, maybe then it's the the nomad thing is okay. getting overhead. You know, then I just do Quebec, Montreal, but I also want to do Le- Leedville 100 mountain bike race. We want to go to Hawaii. We're going to travel. Okay. Yeah, and maybe some holidays. So I don't know. Maybe some bike holidays. Maybe some people want to join. I don't okay. know. We'll okay. see. <laughs> and I think you did consider for a time joining an American team and maybe racing yeah. on the American scene. But where does this fascination with the United States come from? Is it your fascination or your wife's fascination? Oh, both. I like it. I relax when I'm there. And I always wanted to do one year of traveling with the kids before they go to school. First, we were dreaming about like a mobile home holiday in, uh, in uh, Europe, like yeah. before we went to the U.S. And then it became, uh, we went to the US, of U.S. for holidays a few times. And it's, it's just a nice country to me. You know, everything is big, uh, the cars, the food uh, it's, it's just chill relax nice people mm. everyone share their stuff with, mm. uh, with you they really 
they eat a lot of, a lot of grilled food, which of course yeah. everyone knows you like. Are you still grilling? It's every meal, isn't it? Or at least uh, once at every least, day? At least once every day. At least at night, I'm grilling. Yeah, so I'm really happy. The Airbnb house we booked needs to, they had a barbecue on the deck, you know, and it needs to be a, yeah, it needs to be a grill on the deck, otherwise we won't book it. No, no. <laughs> is there any kind of a f official recognition of the fact that you have a barbecue every day? Is there any kind of no, um, no world record? Yeah. I like to cook outside, but yeah. it's not that I do the dirty stuff, you know. I just grill a small piece of meat or fish. Or, yeah. Yeah. It's not like I do all sausages or yeah. things like that. Yeah. No, no. I need to stay slim and I need to stay healthy and. Uh, but it's just a nice passing time for me. Like in a, in a home in Maastricht, my barbecue was next to the kitchen. You know, I could walk in out and I could chop chop everything and just throw it on the boat. It was really nice. And on the road, you'd been in the same team for a long time. You've yeah. made you've made a change this year. I mean, we just saw you there at the team presentation, and there are a lot of very very young faces yeah. there. And then there's there's your slightly more let's say more experienced looking face um, you will have a big role won't you uh, instilling some of your wisdom and some of yeah. your experience in a lot of young riders yeah yeah I'm looking forward to be part of the, the young team and also to get into the dynamic of young 20 years old you know because I'm mid, mid 30 already and also to save them for some mistakes maybe I made or, or I saw other people make or uh, you know there's a lot of attention coming into those guys you know mm -hmm. they earn a lot of money yeah. in a, at a young age and yeah. uh, to stay focused on cycling you know yeah. and, uh, and things what, what are really important in life mm -hmm. and also maybe uh, not to moan too much too quick about mm -hmm. things in the team no terrain and things like that yeah. but see also the good things like I said like the amount of clothes it, at least it, <laughs> we cannot complain it's not enough you know yeah. and things yeah, like yeah. that apparently we got a really good uh, clothing sponsor yeah. which is also really good quality and I was smiling because I also do less races but I can put every race new socks on already now I got a bunch of socks I've never seen so much you know and what I see from this team it's a good team and having had your um, top 10 it was top 10 in the Tour de France two years ago is it a relief slightly to be out of a Dutch team and to be out of, to be away from some of the pressure maybe pressure you yeah. put on yourself as well to repeat yeah, that I got a lot of pressure for myself last year it caught up with me a little bit to be honest that's what I mean to get away maybe those pressure from Tom or Warren we, we, we also take a lot of pressure. I mean, I remember seeing you after the team time trial last yeah, year and you were a broken man, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, uh, that was really, you know, and things got worse from there and I broke the back a week after the tour and that's why I decided, okay, stop it, you know, and I decided, what, what are you doing? And the, from Paris, if you count 90, 100 days backwards, I was only 10 days home and I got two small kids, you know, and that's why I decided, yeah, I want to do a little bit balanced, private and cycling. Yeah. So you considered stopping everything there, did you? No, I considered going to the US and racing for domestic jelly belly team like that or something like that and just for fun and I don't mind being in my naked ass next to a car <laughs> changing clothes uh, after a crit or something I was looking forward to that you know and yeah. get rid of all the pressure I, I, I put on myself and uh, I'm really happy in the team now and uh, I think I'm going to have a good year together with Warren Tom and the other guys you know? one year contract you're going to be helping Tom you're going to specifically I think be helping Warren at the tour um, are you looking beyond that one year are yeah. you thinking you'll stick around for even longer I'm not looking beyond actually August anymore I don't have a house yet <laughs> back then no but we'll see you know the thing is uh, April 2017 my oldest is five he needs to go to school in Holland so maybe I'm uh, for sure we'll be back in Holland uh, I don't know what I do next winter then maybe I train for a new season maybe I do bicycle holidays in the US traveling on my mountain bike or I don't know gravel bike and have fun with friends and invite them to come over and camping and things like that we'll see you know if I really like it I, I can still do another year from Europe then from, uh, from March 2017 if the team likes it it also depends you know some some things just come to an end too and sometimes you have to call it a call it a day and move on to new things I don't know uh, so far I'm focused on the tour and what happens after for sure it will be good things. No worries, I'm not worried about the black hole, we say the after the career, you know. I got plenty of things to do. I, I got nice kids, I got plenty of holidays in my head I need to do. And then thousands of barbecues. Yeah, thousands of grilling and good meat and big Sunday roasts and have fun, drink wine and enjoy life. And maybe I can 
share that with other people. That's also something I'd, I'd like to do. And maybe we can have big barbecues at night after big rides in the, during the day and have fun. And we'll see. So we heard there from Lawrence Tendam, the new recruit at Giant Alpeson, uh, 35 years old now, I think he is. He's a veteran, as you say, but a good climber and somebody who will be of great assistance in the in the stage races. We saw last year at the Vuelta where Tom de Moulin was in a, a race-winning position, how little support he had in in the mountains. In fact, John, John Denkob was one of his his key support riders there. So Tendam really um, increases their strength in, in the stage races, but you know, the, the, you were at the launch before the, the crash that we spoke about in part one. What kind of effect is that going to have on the team? They're, they're obviously going to be missing a few key riders for potentially some time, which is a loss in itself. But it will also put more strain on all the other riders, won't it? Yeah, it will. And uh, I have slight concerns about that team and the, the experience in that team. I mean, they do have they do have guys who have a lot of seasons under their belt, likes of Tom Villas, um, Roy Curvers, guys who have been around a lot. But... Um, they are not the guys who they will be relying on for victories. And, you know, at this time of year, I always look at teams and think, where are the early wins going to come from? Because I think that's really important for a team. And not to get into a rut, we've seen it. There's always one team. Every season, there's one team which gets to April, May without a victory, and they start panicking, and it really becomes a big problem. And probably the riders make poor decisions in races because there's this desperation to to get on the score sheet so to speak um, and Giant now without Degenkolb who is one of their bankers they're going to be without him for the first um, couple of months two three months potentially yeah um, and you know without Balguin for a while as well um, I just I just worry slightly that they might find themselves and without Marcel Kittel it, well, they, effectively without, they were out with, without him last year as well another rider who was involved in the crash unfortunately is the, the German sprinter foot near pro this year Max Valchard who was going to well certainly um, everyone I spoke to at the giant Alpecin team launch in Berlin was had been very very impressed with him in the training camps that they'd had um, up to that point, he'd been sprinting against Degenkolb in practice sprints, beating him fairly comprehensively. And there was a lot of excitement about what he might do early this year. Talk of him being the new Kittel, probably slightly exaggerated, but still. And he was someone who could potentially have picked up some early wins for them. He's going to be out for a while as well. So I think it's going to be a delicate period. Having said that, the crash might also bring them together. It might... Um, it might Galvanise them. Yeah, it might galvanise mm. them. So certainly we can... We would keep our fingers crossed that that mm. will happen. But you spoke to Tom Wheelers as well, who was Kittel's lead-out man, and and you know you you spoke to him about the very strange position he finds himself in now, being possibly, arguably, or someone who's been described as the world's best lead-out man without the world's best sprinter. Yeah, he's the the sort of um, bride's left standing at the altar, isn't he? Really, um, that now that Kittel. Now that this gl- the glistening blonde Adonis has been whipped away from him, <laughs> um, we should point out his joint ethics quick step. He has joint ethics yeah. quick step. Any any gossip on you know what? We still don't really know what happened with, with Kittle. Well, there, there have been a few things over the past few weeks that have have leaked out. The certainly the suggestion that Giant Alberton run a very very tight ship and. Um, even Spreckenbrink, uh, the manager, is someone who likes his protocols. Um, he likes everything to be very well organised, very prescribed. Certainly in terms of itineraries, when riders um, are at races, when they're not at races, they have to report back to the team a lot. And Kittle being the star man was under a lot of pressure, I think, in, in terms of PR obligations, etc. So I think he was um, being asked to do a lot of different things. And I think at, at a certain point, that maybe became a, a little bit asphyxiating for him um, the team also I mean I, I wouldn't link this to Kittle's departure but the team for example has a very very strict internal anti-do- anti-doping policy protocols um, this was something I spoke to Speck and Brink about that even, he even suggested that the team might go so far um, he didn't say whether they had done this but they might go so far as to search riders bags if they had any suspicions that they might be taking illegal medicine to races so um that is very much the sort of context, the environment at Giant Alpecin. And I think at a certain point, Kittle decided that it all got a little bit too much for him. And he's moved to an environment which is very, very different. Um, Ethics Quickstep is probably, 
I would say, the opposite end of the scale in terms of um, being quite relaxed mm. and quite sort of ad hoc in, in some respects. Um, and it'll be interesting to see whether that sort of breath of fresh air is I'm sure Kittle will see it mm. that way will have a positive effect on him and, and the same applies to Dan Martin I think I mean Dan Martin has moved from a team was different from Giant Alperson but he's moved from Cannondale Garmin uh, which again has its own quirks and its own mm. um, quite particular ways of doing things and he's moved to Ethics where I think it will be a lot more laissez-faire the approach and it'll be interesting to see whether that galvanises him Let's hear from Tom Wheelers shall we uh, this is Daniel in conversation with Tom Wheelers Tom I remember two years ago I think it was Algamin Dagblatt said that you were the best lead out man in the world but now you're a lead out man without a sprinter to lead out it seems like because your partner in crime Marcel Kittel has left does that leave you in a difficult position? They read that I uh, that I am the best lead out man in the world but uh, of course there are other really good uh, lead out guys and uh, I think this is the best lead out team uh, in the world so it, it was the team uh, who did it and, and not me as a, as a person on my own. Next to that uh, we have some, uh, some really strong guys. Maybe they didn't achieve what Marcel achieved last year, but we have uh, Max Walscheid who is an upcoming German uh, sprinter, yeah. where I'm really curious uh, how far he can come in sprints because he, he's pushing a lot of values and doing good sprints in training, uh, but only needs fine-tuning in the races. Mm. Furthermore, we have Ramon Sinkelam, uh, Dutch rider, who is also good in sprinting, uh, and, and Nikias Arndt, who is also yeah. good in it. I have to say, exceptional talent of Marcel was, yeah, was, was huge. He was mm. one of the, the top sprinters. In some moment, he was the top sprinter in the world because he was extremely fast, extremely powerful, and, uh, and leaving him out was, of course, led to a, a success of also our team because it made it visible that, that we are doing good lead-outs. Yeah. Uh, and when a good sprinter fails uh, and becomes second or third, then you at least tried to get him on the, the highest platform, but the outer public doesn't see that we are doing a good job. How much did him not racing last year affect you? Were you kind of sometimes sitting at home waiting, wondering when Marcel was going to be fit again and waiting to define your race? race program um, in accordance with what he was going to do so it, it was completely messed up due to sickness and due to uh, and it was from him from his part but also from my part I never experienced uh, a year like that because I had a, a knee injury uh, what I still have some problems with uh, last year what really yeah sidelined me for for almost all the season also made me not ride uh, for a really really long time it's not as though you were kind of waiting around to see where you know waiting no. for myself to get fit you were no, you I were struggling a, yourself I could ride a schedule and I could settle me myself in uh, and also in uh, in helping others yeah. and uh, it was not only Marcel who was, uh, who was the guy for us there were more guys uh, uh, for us who are um, uh, good to work for and, and also can do a, a big result. There was never a chance of you going with Marcel to Ethics, no? The... I, uh, no, I still have a contract and, uh, and that was not, uh, not in the plan, no. Yeah. And would you say that um, Marcel is an easy guy to lead out? He's gone to Ethics as a team there um, which is not set up for him. You'd, you'd built your team, you'd built your lead out over three or four years and you'd done an awful lot of practice at altitude yeah. and uh, training camps at altitude and et cetera, et cetera. And he's gone there and um, he's going to have to do that again. Do you think it'll, it'll be a problem for him? On some hand, yes, and on some hand, no, because he has a new team, so the, the riders have to, have to get used to his uh, tactics and, uh, and thing, things uh, how he wants to, uh, to be lead out. But you know, Marcel was new in our team, so that's why it took some time uh, to, uh, to lead him out, of course, because we have to, had to get used to each other. And uh, he was new in sprinting, uh, so he really has to yeah, uh, get a tactic and also uh, to know when to go. Uh, what is really important, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the years, he developed that, and we developed ourselves as well. And in the end, it made him win, uh, and us as well, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of nice races, yeah. uh, also in Grand Tours and, uh, and day races. And I think he has to get used to it uh, this year with his new teammates. But Marcel is, is really powerful, and also he can can tell for sure his new team colleagues uh, how he wants it. Maybe it, it's going a little bit often wrong uh, compared to uh, what he's used to yeah. with us last year but for sure you he will he'll manage to, uh, to do good results. How do you see the, the balance of power now between the top sprinters? Uh, everyone expected 
Marcel to continue his domination last year. What actually happened was that Andre Greipel sort of had a resurgence and then Cavendish is still there and Kittel is coming back. I mean, how yeah. do you think those three are going to measure up this year? You have a lot of guys who are also uh, competing with these riders and also beating them, uh, like uh, John Buhani, uh, Demar, of course Christoph. These riders are also really, really strong. But uh, pure to, to maximum speed and, and maximum power, I think these are the, 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 the main guys last, uh, last season. And uh, I think when they're all fit, you can, have, you can see a lot of uh, nice challenges. Mm. And I hope uh, with one of our sprinters we can uh, work things out and uh, see if there's uh, something possible mm. uh, to, uh, to jump in there and, uh, and get a victory somewhere. Mm. You talk to any of the sprinters now, and particularly Cavendish, and he talks about how sprints have changed over the course of his career and they've changed partly because of what your team did and how your team changed the lead out um, you know it was more aggressive it was later etc I mean what changes have you seen over the years I, uh, I saw of course uh, some changes yeah before it, I think it was um, uh, everybody just respected uh, uh, HCC and, and uh, were riding behind them uh, but we knew as, as well that, that when we start behind uh, this lead out, because they had a really strong lead out, that we would go on a, yeah, would be too far back for, for, for beating them. Yeah. So we had to yeah, fix a plan. And it's, it's not aggressive, but it's just a way uh, that we were coming late with, with mm. full power uh, on a shorter bit instead of riding 5k already on the front mm -hmm. and, uh, and doing it like HTC did it. So it was just an yeah, adaption to our thing, how we could beat, because you have to find tricks, fair tricks, to, to, to beat each other. Mm. Typically, to be specific, the kind of flag would come down for you guys at sort of 2.5k to go around there, 2k no, to... it depends on, depends depends on, on, the, uh, on the finish. Yeah. If it's a flat straight, uh, it can be one kilometer. Yeah. But uh, if it's uh, a lot of curves and uh, I don't know what, yeah. uh, wind or, or yeah. something, it could be five. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, yeah. Depends all on, uh, on the course. Last thing, did you get a Christmas card from Mark Cavendish? Because he still talks a lot about the, the 2012 crash in San Marlo. No. <laughs> and you didn't send one either. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, brought to you by Trainer Road. Cycling's most effective training tool. Pair your power meter with over 800 workouts and 80 training plans to make you a faster cyclist. Visit trainerroad.com forward slash TCP to try Trainer Road risk free for 30 days. And we mentioned earlier on that our training really continues, Lionel, not Daniel, but Rob Hatch is also still very committed, I think, to the Trainer Road program. And we're all building up towards our race, which looks wow. like it might happen at the Manchester Velodrome. Now. Yeah, I mean, I'm stunned by this news that we're. Hearn Hill and now Manchester Velodrome. Are they? Get are they anyone at Hearn Hill? Are they? Are they, they didn't get. They didn't reply to my emails. Ah. How do we go from talking about Tom Vila's muscle because they're very pinnacle of professional cycling to it's sort of pretty, poor? It's a pretty easy segue, Daniel. <laughs> pub Sunday league. This is lucky. <laughs> Listen, this pair of clogs. March, March, sometime in March, uh, there'll be the big showdown. Myself, Lionel, Bernie, and Rob Hatch at the Manchester Velodrome. We're trying to get trying to get some coaches roped in for the occasion. Have you sold the TV rights yet, Rich? Yeah, working that? on that. Right, working on that. Good. Working on that. Buying the the sale of the TV rights. If anyone we offer some money to come, someone to come and film it, please. No, it'll be good fun. Um, and. I'm still enjoying the program very much. It's all it's all very good. We're going to do a little kilometer zero special on our training, on training generally, I think. But looking at the, the the training we've been doing, and you know, hopefully that'll be of interest to anyone who is also like us, uh, an elite athlete, um, professional, well, almost professional cyclist. Anyway, um, <laughs> there was there has been some proper racing going on uh, the last week or so in Argentina and Australia. What are I mean Tour Down Under first World World Tour race of Always the year. Lionel's favourite race. Always mm, Lionel's I got a bit race. of bit of criticism for my comment in one of the Friends specials at the, at the end of the year for calling it a pre season friendly the Tour Down Under. But stand well, by you, that. You've reminded me there to I was supposed to mention the Friends specials. Thank you every to everybody who has signed up to become a friend of the podcast in twenty sixteen. There's been a really great response to our 2016 package. We launched our, we released our first friend special last week, 
which was behind the scenes with Chris Froome in the lab when he went in to do his tests. And the next one is a special on HTC High Road, uh, which is coming up in February, and that includes a very interesting interview with Bob Stapleton, uh, conducted by Daniel. And that that that'll be really interesting, um, I hope. And there's been a great response. Thank you very much. It's ten pounds for the year. That will get you eleven exclusive friends podcasts, and they are available on your mobile phone. You'll get a, a, a feed for 2016. You can also now get a feed for 2015. So they are fully downloadable on your mobile phone. Uh, thecyclingpodcast.com to sign up to become a friend of the podcast. So the racing, Lionel, Tour Down Under. Mm. Sorry, I stopped you mid-flow there. You were just waxing lyrical about the Tour Down Under. Uh, well, I mean, it, 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 it's it's getting slightly harder, slightly more challenging, isn't it? Look, there's a, just definitely a sense that it's a tougher race than it used to be when, you know, it used to just be basically four or five sprint stages and Willunga Hill. Now there's a couple of uh, lumpier um, stages, which is plays into Simon Guerin's hands, really. Um, he's now the uh, he's the Eddie Merckx of the Tour Down Under, with four, with four wins in the Tour Down Under's long and illustrious history, which stretches all the way back to the year 2000. OK, Lionel, that's uh, enough. <laughs> that's enough. We, we value our audience in Australia. I've been the no. Tour Down Under a couple of times, unlike you. And I can tell you that it's a fantastic race. Absolutely. And yeah. there's lots to commend it. And, and the riders, I think, love it. Um, and there's you, a big scrap for World Tour points already. Mm, yeah, I mean... You, press releases this week from teams celebrating their first well, World Tour points. Well, th- th- this team. does matter. You mentioned the importance of teams getting off to a winning mm. start. Orica Green Edge with Caleb Ewan and, and Simon Gerrans have got off to a, a great start. Classic example, Richard. Cannondale Garmin, I was going to mention. You mentioned, well. mentioned their... Our HTC High Road or a High Road special, mm. um, you know, as we will talk about, as we will discuss, I think in that, Al, um, Andre Greipel winning how many stages? Four stages. Four, five yeah. stages of that in two thousand and eight was seen as a real um, springboard for for that team, not only in that season but throughout their history. Yeah, good point. Good point. Even even though you know when you were talking earlier, Daniel, about teams struggling to get the momentum and and then you know that becoming a bit of a monkey on the back of a team not getting that first win Cannondale Garmin were the obvious example last year and I I noticed Jonathan Vauter is tweeting furiously about the successes that his team had I think they had a a decent turn under they won the team classification and he was certainly enjoying that Jonathan Vauter but clearly keen to not to, to get this season off to a slightly different start to last season. Well, absolutely. I mean, for Simon Gerrans, I mean, last year it really was a, a terrible year for him. Uh, he crashed just before the Tour Down Under, uh, broke his collarbone there. He crashed again at the Strada Bianchi in Italy in when was that? March. March, isn't it? Uh, fractured his elbow, came back, crashed again at Liège, Baston Liège, crashed and abandoned the Giro halfway through. Crashed on stage three of the tour in that terrible crash mm. and broke his wrist. And I mean, you know that you, that's pretty much as bad as luck can get. And so for him, uh, hugely important to get back, get 2016 off to a good start, off to a winning start. And for Orica Green Edge, you know, it's their it's their home race, mm. hugely important for them. And Caleb Ewan, interesting, isn't stepped it? up a level and, yeah. and now is sort of moving into the bracket of Kittle, Cavendish, and Co. in the sprint stakes. I so. mean, Orica, they're an interest. You know, they've lost some of the sort of talisman, the Australian talisman that you th- when the team was set up you thought the team was going to form around the likes of Cameron Meyer who's now at Dimension Data people like that um, Matt but, Goss Matt Goss yeah um, but you Who's know like opening the batting for one pro cycle <laughs> next week at the Tour of Dubai yeah <laughs> well very good Just... um, yes uh, but they're, they're you know Garens is still obviously a, a force to be reckoned with Caleb Ewan is the, the young you know, and very promising looking sprinter who does get incredibly low over the front of his bike, dangerously low, I think. I mean, yeah. at what point is he going to just tip over <laughs> and do a sort of somersault? It's going to happen, isn't it? It's going to be Amdu Japarov like but without the Coke ba- uh, barrier. Anyway, Caleb Ewan, how good, how good is he? Cadell McEwen as one illustrious sprinter I referred to him at this time last year when I put it to him that Caleb. <laughs> Caleb Ewan might be the next big thing in sprinting. Oh, yeah, who is that? <laughs> um, well, I won't say. Um, how good is he going to be? Um, 
I think the question is whether he's going to become a pure sprinter or whether he's someone with um, a lot more to his riding than that and someone who can potentially win classics, potentially win, well, certainly is a potential Milan San Remo winner in the future. Um, and and will he lose speed? But not I mean, riding Milan San Remo this year. Not riding, OK. Mm. But he's someone who is got great leg speed, um, very, very fast, nippy, reminiscent of Cavendish. Those qualities tend to ebb slightly with age. Is he someone who will become, as I say, more of an all-round rider as the years go by? I, th- I certainly think that he could be prolific in the, in the next two or three years. You get the sense that Orica are really handling him very carefully in the same way that they have with the Yates brothers, really. They're, they're really looking at their long-term development and Ewan seems to have been around for a few years already but he's very sort of gradually being exposed to harder and harder racing I think and you know Orica are proving themselves to be quite a good team in, in in terms of managing talent in that sense Still only 21 so you could argue he's off to a sort of faster start to his career than Cavendish was who you know who once he got winning he was unstoppable for a few years so you know Ewan I think is going to do the Giro isn't he um so it'll be, you know, that will be the first big opportunity to see how good he is at, at this early stage in his career. But you know, I'm, I'm, it's it's good to see somebody come along who does, you know, create a bit of a talking point. The the way he sprints is exciting to watch. It's it's different. It's it, it is reminiscent of Cavendish when he was doing that very low, but more extreme. Style, but it is more mm. extreme, and it, it's uh, you know, it, it clearly works for him. Yeah, we we thought that when Cavendish did emerge in 2008 with this very distinctive style that there would be a whole glut of riders that came after him mimicking his style. Um, a few did come and go and briefly threaten um, to do just that. You know, Andrea Guardini was one, um, a very diminutive guy, got very low over the bars, but actually it was the, the sort of big powerful sprinters that kind of returned and have held sway over the last couple of years, isn't it, with people like Kittle and and um, Gripe, when I mentioned um, Valscheid earlier, the young giant Alperson sprinter, who's another one who's, you know, I think he's a six foot six, six foot seven. So it'll be interesting contrasting styles um, if, if Ewan um, does develop in the way that we expect up against the, those bigger guys. Right, listen, we should wrap it up there. Well, just very quickly, what about Richie Port? What, a, what winning- about Richie Port? One on Willunga Hill. He's one on Willunga, right? Willunga Hill before. Yeah, but in a, in, this time in a red and black jersey as opposed to in a blue and black jersey. I mean, so hugely what? significant. Um, <coughs> not really, Lionel. If Willunga Hill is the Alpe d'Huez of Adelaide, what is Corkscrew Road? Is that the... Oh. Is that the... Um, nos, um, Nossa Senora da Graça. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> you took the words right out of my the mouth. Emblem, the, emblem, the emblematic climb of the Volta Portugal. <laughs> No? Ah, oh, oh right, yeah. You yeah, thought that. That's certainly what the, what the hipsters call it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there was big news last week with the Giro d'Italia wildcards. No place oh, yes. for Gianni Savio <sighs> and Androni Giocattoli. End of an era. It is, and uh, well, it could well be the end of the team. The team's been around for twenty years, and um, well, they're going to celebrate the twentieth year at the end of this year. And I spoke to Gianni briefly last week. Um, he's pretty pessimistic and. You know that the gap between the haves and have-nots of of professional cycling has just grown wider and wider over the last three or four years. And um, you know, Savio is really competing, trying to compete with the same budget that he had a few years ago. And I'm um, sorry, yeah, the, the same budget he, he had um, four or five years ago, um, maybe four or five million euros. Meanwhile, the the leading teams in the World Tour have gone from 20 to 30 to 40 million. I mean, this has happened quite, you know, quite dramatically and and almost without really being discussed all that much. It's it's really over the last four or five years. I think Jonathan Vaught has spoke about it last year at the Tour. This huge, huge, you know, a few years ago, T-Mobile were, you know, the the best funded team in the world at 10 million euros a year, 12 million euros a year budget. Now you're talking 30 million. Yeah, they have. And, And the... The quality of the rider that that teams like Androni Giocattoli can sign has diminished um, in sync, in line with that trend, really. And they found themselves having to fish around for, for guys Sa- who... Uh, Savio's even talking about coming to the Manchester Velodrome <laughs> in March just to keep a tabs on our three-man <laughs> race. <laughs> they, they've found themselves having to... Um, well, they, they, you know, they're still 
trying very hard to exploit the Italian talent pool, but the Italian talent pool is no longer what it was. Uh, you know, the big Italian under-23 races no longer represent the benchmark in amateur cycling. So, you know, they still perhaps pick up some of the best graduating under-23s, but they're no longer necessarily um, the biggest talents on the international stage. And they've also found themselves having to pick up guys who are really in the last chance saloon and often it's a very risky exercise and they've had numerous positive tests in the last three or four years perhaps not been vigilant enough but it's also um it, it's it comes with the territory of mm. trying to pick up bargains you know well and also i mean the, the market's changed in the sense that Savio used to go and pick up riders from south america for next to nothing now those south american riders are back in vogue with the bigger teams and are getting opportunities with world tour teams at much earlier stages so the landscape has changed yeah landscape. And, and you know there are questions to be asked over whether the giro should be protecting um teams that probably italian teams that perhaps don't deserve to be there um, on merit anymore, such as Savia's team, such as Bardiani, such as Southeast. And um, my personal view is that they perhaps um, could have given um, Andrea Giocattoli a, a chance, certainly over Gazprom, um, the Rosvello, the um, the Katuja development team. Effectively, there are various issues there that that team has had positive tests. There is a potential conflict of interest or potential. Um, common interest with Katuja, so you could mm. potentially have a, a World Tour team there and its development team effectively, you know, riding for the same objectives, and which creates problems. Um, I think the reality is, and no one has really said this explicitly, but I think there are financial reasons for having Gazprom there. Well, yeah, you only have to look at sports sponsorship in a wider context than cycling, and the name Gazprom is yeah. prominent in Champions League football, tennis, other sports. So RCS obviously having a challenging time commercially at the yeah. moment. You know, d decisions have to be made, and um, you know, uh, Savio has, has found himself on the wrong side of the line this time. And it would be naive, I think, to suggest this is the first time that's happened as well. I mean, last year we saw the Polish team, um, CCC, mm -hmm. taking part in the Jira again, and there was talk, there were rumours there of, um, I wouldn't say money having changed hands, but certainly. Um, a bit of back, mutual back scratching. Um, even going further back, I think there have been teams that have not necessarily been chosen on merit. Right, well, on that note, uh, the racing continues next week. Uh, Tour of Dubai, isn't it? Second Tour of Dubai. Marcel Kittel making his debut for Ethics. Quite sad, be interesting to see how he gets on there. Um, he will want to, I think, start winning early. Flying, I've heard, in training. Really? Absolutely you, flying. We heard that before the Tour de France last year and he didn't end up going. I've heard that... Um, Actually, I heard that he beat Tony, Tony Martin, Martin in a test. Physiological in test. a test yeah. uh, that they carried out. Brian Holmes said that. Um, so he's flying in tests, but will he, that translate to the road? Because clearly there might, might be a confidence issue there as well. You, you just don't know. Anyway, we don't like speculation, do we, Lionel? We'll just see what happens. I would mm. speculate that his hair will be looking magnificent. His hair is amazing. I mean, I saw it a couple of weeks ago. I saw his hair. Really? Right. In, I did an he interview. He was wearing a baseball cap. Did an interview with him uh, for a forthcoming special, yeah. Friends of the Podcast special. That's another one coming up. Um, did an interview with him, and uh, he was munching an apple, which wasn't great for a podcast interview, but we managed <laughs> to, to get around that, and his hair was looking incredibly... Even without the giant Alperson. Even without that. Well, he might still use Alperson, I don't know. Mm. He does. Anyway. Does he not now have to use Lidl's own brand shampoo? <laughs> well, if he does, he's a great <laughs> advert for it. I think we'll all be getting some Lidl own brand shampoo. Won't we'll I, I won't. Too I won't. Late for you. Yeah, it's a bit late for me. Anyway, listen, let's leave it there. We'll be back next week and uh, we'll have more interviews and analysis from the training camps and the racing and so on. So thank you very much for listening this week. Thank you very much, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. You've been listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Thank you to Glass Pair for the music in this episode. For more information and to download more editions of the show, visit thecyclingpodcast.com.